Um, good afternoon. As we tweeted, uh, this will be a back-to-back -back session. First part is going to be a little bit more theoretical for the non-developers among you who isn't a developer. Uh, some. Who are developers? Uh, I like that. A room full of developers. For the non-developers among you, I'll talk a little bit about philosophy for the first part. I maybe talk a little bit about evolution too in the first part. Uh, just to explain what we're doing and where we're going. In the second part, which will already be part of the first hour, we're going to code. This is why I need you in front so you can actually see the code examples. Um, we're going to try to build a component in approximately an hour. We're going to add a little bit of tagging to it, some versioning. We're going to add a, a little bit of logging to it, and we will make all that work. But first, a little bit about Nuku. Um, Nuku is becoming an open source web platform. Um, I have a new toy and I'm trying to figure out. But the first question that I've, I'm gonna try, I'm gonna try to answer two questions. First, why? And second, what? I have had many people come to me in the last two days and ask you, why are you doing Nuku? And that's a very hard question to answer. I still remember the first Joomla day in the Netherlands, and that was 2006, let's call that six years ago. Uh, five years, no, six, five years ago, uh, in April. Uh, there came, was a guy that came up to me after the Joomla day. First Joomla day was super chaotic. We, we, they aimed for 30 people, they went from 250, they went to another venue, they went to another venue, and in the end we had 120, and we needed to find chairs everywhere to seat everybody. And at the end of the presentation somebody asked me and he said like, why are you doing this? And I had no clue. I, I still trying to figure it out. But there are two things that I think I figured out and this is one. Because it's something I like to do. It's not for the money. It's because I like to do that. That's why a lot of us open source developers. Do I need to move here? Oh, you're, you're, you're okay. Out. <laughs> That's why a lot of us open source developers are sharing and writing and collaborating code. Because they like to do it. Not because somebody is asking them and paying them to do it. That's one. And the second is because there is purpose in doing that. 15 years ago, if you would have asked any manager in any company, how am I going to make my employees work harder? And still today, if you ask many managers, they will answer you, you pay them more, you give them benefits, you give them advantages when they work harder, you set goals. Well, ladies and gentlemen, that does not work. And I'm not saying that Professors are saying that from MIT and Carnegie Mellon have done research and it doesn't work. And why doesn't it work? Because you are the living proof that that doesn't work. You build open source software every day for free, for nothing, because there is purpose in doing that. We are not only profit maximizers. We are not only in this for the money. We're also in this because there's a little bit more than that. There is purpose in doing that. Those are my two reasons, and I'm still figuring it out. But those are the two after five years I can give you. Now, what? Second question that I've heard in the last two days a lot. What is Nuku? And I think that our friends from Molajo have had the same question. What, is Mol what, what the hell is Molajo? What the hell is Nuku? Well, um, I'll start by telling you what it isn't. And then I'll move on to try to explain to you what we are going to try to build. Now, what isn't? Well, it's a name, but it is definitely not, and I've said this many times, it's not a product. You don't get it off a shelf. You don't just install it, and if you don't like it, you throw it away. I still remember five years ago when we started Joomla, there were a lot of extension developers that were picturing their extensions as little boxes on their website. Right? Consumption society, hello. That's not, that's not open source, right? That's product. 
That's cars and other shit you buy, and then when you don't need it, you throw it away. We tried to do that a little bit different. Not a product. It's not a fork. To fork something, first of all, you need to have a group of people that were working together and then disagree on that thing that they were doing. To have one group go left and the other group go right. That's a fork. If you have a group of people that doesn't disagree with anybody else, but is just building new software, new technology, their way, they're not forking. They're evolving. They're innovating. That's the difference. And lastly, it's not a CMS. Been there, done that, got the t-shirt and the cap, which I still proudly wear. Um, but we're not building yet another CMS. There are 150 CMSs out there, open source, closed source, a lot of open source already. Don't want to do that again. Why? Want to go a step further, right? You want to evolve yourself too. You want to see where you can go. So it's not a CMS. Now, what is it then? Well, we're still figuring it out, right? It doesn't work like that. A lot of people in the Joomla community shout like, we need a mission statement. And in the Nuku community sometimes too, we need a mission statement, we need, we need vision, we need leaders. It doesn't work like that. You cannot leaders simply create a menu and say, this is it. And then hopefully the cook and cook it, the one you hire, right? We're figuring it out. What we do know is that we're about free and open source software. Right? And a lot of people, if you ask them, why are you using Joomla? They will tell you, because it's free, and then they mostly mean free as in free beer. And that's true, but there's a little bit more to it than just that. It's about collaboration. It's about working together. I have a lot of people that come to us on the mailing, a lot. I have some people on the mailing list and they say, hey, we're interested in, uh, in Nuku, and we like what you guys are doing, but well, we will look at it when it's done. And then I say, well, please don't come back. Right? If you don't want to make the engagement and to involve yourself helping it to get done, then don't come back when it's done. Because then you're just another parasite that is going to use all the hard work of others. So don't come back. Collaborate. If you come to me and you say, hey, how can we help you? How, we have an idea here. How can we do something with that? Then we talk. And then I'll tell you, write some code, and then we will look at that. Collaboration, innovation. It's about having all these crazy geeks, and there are a lot of in the team already, and we have 25 contributors with crazy ideas, getting them to write code and then see what we can do with that. Does that code today solve problems? Probably not, because it's not a product yet. And products are created for features and for customers to solve problems directly. But hopefully in the future, they will, because these guys are, are out, they're basically, if, if it's a chess game, they're five, five games, five steps ahead. They're solving problems tomorrow, of the problems of tomorrow today. It's about architecture. There are 5,000, 7,000, 8,000 Joomla extensions. They all built, or they should be, built on an architecture that helps them to connect. The better that base architecture works, the easier it becomes to innovate and move forward on top of that. What I do know is that we need more architecture to solve the problems of tomorrow. It's about developers. If you're a user, we don't have anything for you. If you just use software, then there are people that can integrate software for you and build solutions for you that do that for a living. And we will help you find those people. But we, we cannot help you as a user. It's very much about a meritocracy. There are many ways you can govern an open source project. I very much believe that meritocracy is one of the better. And it simply says that those who work the hardest and contribute the most, will get the most say in what gets done. And that's already happening today. We have 25 contributors. These guys have a direct say in what we're doing. 
And of course, it's about technology. Otherwise, we wouldn't be doing this. It wouldn't be about cooking, because I'm not really such a good cook. Maybe I can get there, but um, not yet. And lastly, it's about the web. Are we all working on the internet? right? So it's very much about the web. Now, these are the three things I want to cover. These are hard topics. Vision, architecture, and platform. Vision first. It's probably the hardest question to answer, but the easiest question to ask. What is your vision? Have you ever asked yourself what your personal vision is? Ever tried to do the exercise? It's damn hard. But you should try. But it will learn you a lot about what you know and what you don't know and what you want to try to figure out. Now here, vision. Like I said, we're constantly refactoring, so this changes. But this is where we are today. I divided, it, I divided the vision and I was looking, actually, <laughs> the vision that is on there, I formulated this morning on the ski slope. It, it helped. And, and where are they? The, the guys, where is uh, Peter? Is Peter around? He was, no, he's not here. He was skiing. We had a lot of fun. Vision, three parts. Philosophy. Try to define a philosophy in one line. Well, I think this is it. It's not the strongest of species that survive, not, nor the most intelligent, but the most responsive to change. It's not the strongest open source projects or technologies that survive. It's not the most intelligent, it's the one that are most responsive to change. That goes for any open source community. And as I explained to a lot of people in the past few days, technology is an exponential curve. The web is an exponential curve. Hardware evolves and increases exponentially. That means that our knowledge needs to increase exponentially to follow that. We cannot do that alone anymore. Right? We need to do that together. We need to come up with ways to be able to change, to adapt our change rate accordingly to the way that technology evolves before us. Because otherwise, we will be, be the slow Trabant, which is like the Russian car, and the Ferrari is driving over there. Like, and the longer we drive, the further it will be away from us. And by the end, it will be a dot in the distance. So we need to figure out ways to make sure that we can change and evolve at a, at a rapid pace. And that's one of the things that we try to do with Nuku. Is that easy? No, it's damn hard. But at least we try. So change is the word that I noted this morning. Second, community. We are a community of people. When I talk about community, and there are different ways of defining the word community, I talk about people that actually contribute, that give back. There is a win-win for being involved. A lot of people and a lot of companies consider their community, their users, their customers. Well, I consider that simply a customer, right? A, somebody that comes on a forum to ask a question, to me, isn't a community member. He simply has a question. Somebody that comes to contribute and give back, that's a community member, that is a contributor. That giving back can happen in many ways. Just building on top of it, and then selling that, to me, isn't giving back. That's just making use of. So, what are we trying to do with our community? And a lot of people have asked this question and we have waited and to put it out for three years. We are trying to grow the first open source operating system for the web. Does that ring a bell? Or not? It shouldn't because it doesn't exist yet. That's a big vision, right? Visions are big. Are we going to have that tomorrow? Mm -hmm. 
Is it going to, have to take some time? It will be. But we have slowly, step by step, been evolving in that direction over the last three years. The word that I, or the verb that I wrote down this morning is grow. It's not built. As a good friend of mine and a very valuable contributor in different open source projects once said, you don't build an open source project, you grow it. And like with everything, it needs nurturing and it needs time and it goes step by step. Three, the vision is of course also about technology. And in that, and actually that should be switched. Uh, anyway, what we want to do is don't compete, collaborate, and differentiate. And I've said that many times. I have seen a lot of competition in the Joomla community in the past five years. And something that's good and something that isn't that good. I personally think that competition is something that needs to be there in a product sense. In a community sense, you don't compete with the person you actually should be working with. That doesn't work. Result, 25 CCKs, right? They're all doing the same, a little bit different. Where's the benefit in that? Where's the collaboration and the contribution in that? Nowhere. So, if we want to evolve, and then I go back to the first, if we want to evolve at a rapid pace, we need to learn to work together. We need to learn to, to collaborate on the 80% that is common and to differentiate ourselves on the 20% that defines our products, that defines our businesses and our business models. And yes, we need to do that because we need to eat too like everybody else and we are entitled to do that. But we should try to work on that 80% in a collaborative way. And then I go back to technology. We need to build technology that allows us to do that. We need architecture that allows us to do that. So the third verb that I, that I remembered this morning, or that I wrote down this morning, is collaborate. And then, so three, change, grow, and collaborate. I think that that in three words, could define the vision. Like I said, it's a refactoring process. It will refine itself down the path where we go. Now, most important, and I said that, we need architecture to be able to build something like that. We need architecture to be able to collaborate on. We need architecture to allow us to build products. We need architecture that allows us to create win-win situations. And the architecture that we have today and I'm not only talking about Joomla, but many of the open source projects, is a little bit outdated. It's five years old or even older. We need to consider, we need to start thinking about how are we going to start building our architecture today to solve the problems of tomorrow. And there are other open source projects that are doing that. I'm looking at Zend and Zend 2, which is great work that is being done there, which is the next iteration of their platform and their architecture. Symphony and Symphony 2. The next iteration and the next evolution of their platform. Guys from Cake, who two of the developers moved to Lithium and are also looking in that direction. With Nuku, we're also looking in that direction. New architecture. What does that architecture look like? Well, to build architecture, you can just go out and say, hey, let's build something. It's very hard. Because for what? You need at least to define a problem that you're going to try to tackle. By creating a concrete problem, you at least have a start. So this is my problem. This is Joomla, Drupal, WordPress, Plone, whatever is out there. We call it a CMS. It's based around articles and then we add things to it. For example, in Joomla, you have basic article management. And then you have different extensions to do permissions, versioning, taxonomy, trash management, workforce comments, because it's not part of that core. You need to add it to it. And the core is articles, 
the team is CMS. Now, you have Drupal, you have WordPress, you have Molajo, you have Joomla to solve that. And then you get this problem. I want a document management system. And a document management system is made up out of documents. But at the same time, it needs permissions, versioning, taxonomy, trash management, workflows, and comments. And that is exactly the same. A little bit different. Now, try to do that with Joomla. Or with Drupal. It's very hard. Because the modularization of these systems doesn't necessarily allow it. It's very focused on articles, because that's where it started. Here. So, do we have real solutions? Well, you could try to do that with Joomla, and a lot of people do because they have invested in learning Joomla. And you will figure out that it's very, very hard to customize it in a way to become actually a different type of web application. Here's another one. Projects. You want project management. And again, permissions, versioning, taxonomy, trash management, workflows, and discussions. Again, it's the same. A little bit different. And how do we solve that? Well, we don't necessarily solve that. We have 5,000 extensions, and all of these extensions tries to solve this problem in one way or another, on its own. So there is not really something that really does that out of the box in a flexible way. That brings me to architecture, component-based software engineering. There is this beautiful thing in Joomla called a component. Right? And we're all building them. And we're all forgetting what component-based software engineering actually is. Because we're all working in our own little world, building our own component for our own problems and our own clients. And we're not even looking outside of the window what our neighbor is doing. And then our neighbor might also want to use the component that or the customer might want to use the component that our neighbor has built, and then he comes to the conclusion that they don't necessarily work together. And then the neighbor goes, not my problem, his problem. And then you go, not my problem, his problem. And then you keep going back and forward. I enlarge the problem, but that happens a lot. Why? Because we forgot that components in the architecture of Joomla also have the opportunity to work together. That's actually what component-based software engineering is all about. Now, I'm not coming up with that. Now, three advantages of that. One, uh, substitutability. You can take a component that does a certain function, take it out, put another one in that does the same thing but a little bit different. And it could be extended on, on top of the first one. Can you, not, you cannot do that with a Joomla. I try to build a website with a social part to it that has a jump social, then take the wholesome so uh, jump social out to put something else in and it will just work. Mm -hmm. Flexibility. 25 CCKs, all doing the same thing. That's 25 times 80% of that solution again and again and again being repeated. This is a little bit stupid, right? Because you're writing the same code again and again and again just to prove the point that you can write the code. Maybe you could have a flexible system where you can reuse that part of that functionality. And three, reusability, where you build a solution once, a comment component, a forums component, uh, an e-commerce part, uh, tagging, uh, logging, versioning, and then you reuse it everywhere. And there's actually an open source project that does that. They don't like us that much. And sometimes we don't like them either. But still, our friends from Drupal do that. But they do it in their own way. They have their own ways of dealing with PHP and object orientation and all that. And you can discuss that. That's true. But if there's one thing what they do very well is that they use what they call modules, and that's actually the same approach. Uh, it's a module, and they only build it once. And then they all collaborate on making it better. And when it's good enough, they collaborate on putting it in their core, AK, CCK for Drupal 7, Fuse for Drupal 7, and a few other things that they have moved into the core. Well, if they can do it, why can we not do that? 
So, a few names that you can Google. Douglas McClure, McClure if I pronounce that right, but probably not. Uh, this guy dates back to the 60s. Who, who comes from the 60s? I don't, but are there 60s here? Yeah, you know the golden ages when everything was possible, right? So this guy comes from the 60s and he wrote a paper for NASA, uh, I think it was 68 or 69, uh, where he proposed uh, the basic principles of component-based software engineering. Uh, and that was in the time when software development wasn't going very well. And he was trying to approach that problem. He is also the guy that brought pipes uh, and filters to Unix, which is a very powerful part of the Unix operating system. Here's another one, Brad Cox, probably no idea, who develops for Apple, iOS, who has ever written Objective-C? Some of you? He wrote it. He created it. What? <laughs> I'm not going to discuss that, but Brad, uh, but Brad Cox is the guy who wrote Objective-C, and Objective-C is written with a component-based architecture in mind. He wrote a whole book on that in 94 somewhere, which is one of the first real books where component-based software engineering is explained. And then finally, IBM. IBM has something what they call system object modeling, and then you also have, but I don't like to mention them, Microsoft, which has Ole and Com, which are similar technologies. And IBM and Microsoft are constantly debating who came first with that idea in the 90s. So I like to give it to IBM. Component-based software engineering. The ideas are simple. We create reusable, flexible, and substitutional parts that we can interchange and make work together. Now, if this is a little bit too complex for you, it might be for the non-developers, you Google this. Keep it dry, shy, and tell the other guy. You will find a number of blog posts, and if you look very well, you will find a PDF. Read that PDF. It's only two pages. It explains very clearly and very simply what this is all about. If you are, have developers working for you, this is their number first assignment on Monday. So, how are we doing this in Nuku? And this is where it starts getting a little bit more technical. Our architecture is the... Vi I'm not going to explain it completely because that takes me a whole evening. I'm going to take three parts out of it, three different architectures, and explain those in basics. First part. Nuku implements a resource-oriented oriented architecture. Key word here is resources. Now, what's a resource? Everything. Almost everything. It is, in, in a little bit more simpler terms, anything and everything that you consume on the internet, that you get through a web browser or a phone or anything else, anything that is there is a resource. It's basically a representation of state, a resource. Now, that brings me back, that brings me to REST. Resource object orient, uh, oriented architecture, REST. A RESTful framework or a RESTful architecture. What does that mean or what does REST mean? It doesn't mean you can go to sleep yet. REST stands for Restitutional State Transfer. It was described first in a thesis by Roy Fielding, the guy who also helped to write the HTTP <coughs> protocol. Now, very simply. There's another guy called Richardson who created the maturity model for RESTful frameworks or RESTful architectures. Because everybody today shouts that it's RESTful. And then everybody goes, nice buzzword, but what does it actually mean? So there are three levels of RESTfulness. Level zero, they call that the swarm of pox, which basically means that 
you don't actually do anything that has to do with REST. It basically means that if you're a web application and you have this entry point somewhere, then everybody and anybody can come in through to that entry point and everything happens through that entry point. It's what Joomla does. Joomla does a little bit more, but it's kind of what Joomla does. Index or PHP, and you call that, and from there, everything starts. Second level is a level where you start implementing resources. That means that you can have a URL, and each URL is, an, is a unique a resource where you can go to, right? So if I want to get a user, I would have something like users slash one, and that will be the user with ID one. And I'm identifying the resources by their URL. Second level is when you introduce HTTP verbs. And I'll go back in another slide to show you that. And the third level is what they call hypermedia. That's when the resources also understand the relations to each other. And that's when the web becomes self-describing. And that's where the fun starts, at least <laughs> from my perspective. So at the moment, Nuku Framework, or Nuku, is a level two resource-oriented architecture. Level three is something we want to get to. Refactoring will help us to get there. What does that very simply mean? Well, on the web, you have basically set four methods. You have a few more, but keep with the four. You can do get, you can do post, you can do put, and you can do delete. That's what they originally defined in the HTTP protocol. Those four methods are mapped to five methods in Nuku framework in our K controller, and we will see that a little bit later. We call those bread, and they stand for browse, read, edit, add, and delete. Get is mapped to either browse or read. The difference is that browse gives you a list, and read gives you an item, a single resource. Now, for the purists and the developers among you, what is wrong on this slide? Uh-oh. He actually also asks questions. Shit. What is wrong on the slide? Hmm? Post? What's wrong with post? Correct. Why? Correct. Um, yeah, not really. But the first two are correct. And put doesn't necessarily mean add. It only means add when the URL that you're putting on is a unique URL for the purists among you. So don't come back to me after the presentation and say your slides were slightly wrong. I know, but I'm simplifying. So level two, K controller, MVC. I'm not explaining MVC here. Did that last year. Where do we want to get to? Well, there is something that Roy Fielding in his thesis called HETEOAS, which stands for Hypertext as the Engine of Application State. And what he basically is saying is that HTTP and the web is not a protocol, but a web application platform. And then it gets really fun. So that's where we want to get to. We are at level two. It's orange. Right, we need to get to red, right? So we'll get there, but in time. Um, part one, resource-oriented architecture, which basically means, in simple terms, any component that you build on Nuku Framework implements a resource-oriented architecture and exposes its information, not only through an HTML user interface that you create, but also through JSON. And if you uh, write an XML, uh, uh, um, adapter also through XML, but by default automatically through JSON. Second part, service-oriented architecture. I, I took a lot of time finding these things so that they match. Um, service-oriented architecture, keyword, objects. We all build them every day when we write code, we build objects. What does that mean in Nuku Framework? Well, this might be a little bit hard to see, but it goes back to what we call K-Factory. K-Factory is a way, simply said, you know J-Factory in Joomla? It gets you cache and, la and language and application and document and a few of those things, right? 
it's a factory pattern implemented. Well, we do something very similar, but for any and every object that exists. Any and every object in Nuku Framework you get through the factory. Which means that you can change it through the factory and you can map it through the factory. They call that a service-oriented architecture. Actually, in the next refactoring, we're going to change kfactory to kservice. And then I'm done refactoring that part after three years. Um, but still, uh, that's what we're doing. For developers among you, it's very important. Why? Because there isn't an object in your own or in somebody else's component that you cannot get to, you cannot change, you cannot reuse, or you cannot extend. That's what template overrides do with templates. That's what we do with objects. And the template overrides, of course, are still there. Three. Another nice one. Event-driven architecture. Uh, we all know the Mambots from the early days. We still developed for Mambo. You know them, our good old Mambots, which we changed in plugins and we implemented a what pattern? Um, server pattern, very good. That's point one for the ladies. That's one zero for the ladies. Uh, Amy, do you hear that? Yeah. Okay, good. You keep score, right? <laughs> Excellent. Um, Event-driven architecture. In Joomla 1.5, uh, we added an observable pattern and we made it a little bit easier to dispatch events. But you still need to hard code them. You still need to add your events and hard code them in your code, which is not that handy. Joomla Nuku Framework doesn't have any hard-coded events anymore. Doesn't mean you cannot do that. But the events are dispatched automatically. How do we do that? Well, keyword is events. We use two patterns, a chain of command, which is a COC. For the purists among you, it's a tiny bit different than a COR, which is a chain of responsibility. And I happily discuss that for an hour, but not now. Uh, we use a K command and a K command chain object. And in the controllers and in the, the database layer, and you will see that in a bit, they are exposed as behaviors. They make a certain object behave in a certain way. For example, an object can be taggable, or an object can be executable, or an object can be loggable. And another thing that we do is we implement an observable behavior on top of the commands, and then we use an, a K event and a K event dispatcher, and you find that in the plugins as you know them in Joomla 1.5. K commands work a little bit like this. They work in a chain. It's a, not easy to completely explain, but in the middle you have your K controller edit action. For example, you're editing a form, so you're doing your edit action. Before that edit action is called, we fire the chain. And after the edit action is called, we fire the chain. If any of the commands, because the little blocks in there are commands in this chain, break, as in they return false, the chain breaks. And then the edit action won't be called. Now, what does that solve? It solves ACL out of the box. And yesterday, uh, where is he? Over there, Dave, presented an ACL solution for Nuku Framework that he wrote in three hours that uses that. So, you don't need ACL in your core to solve ACL. You need architecture to solve that. Right? So that solves this. What else does this solve? It solves logging, it solves versioning, it solves... Where are the guys here? Well, they're busy. Um, but it solves a lot of stuff. Because you can start plugging in behaviors that fire before and after any event. And that means any event, because if you add a specific action to a controller, then that whole thing also happens. So, part two, architecture. Part three, building the actual platform. And I gave this presentation a few times. It's online. There are many videos. So I'm not going to do it again. We're going to use the rest of the time for the code. But what are we building or what ha do we ha have we built today? Well, first, well, an open source web application platform. That's our first step. We are still far away from being an open source um, operating system for the web. We need to go level three 
um, our resource-oriented architecture, we need to have a lot more components that can react and interchange with each other before we're there. But we're trying to get there. We build a framework, which is the basis where everything is going to be built upon. We build a server. That server is a multi-site distribution of Joomla at this moment. And then for the people that ask, well, is Nuku server then a fork or what is it actually? Well, we're at the moment using Joomla and we're refactoring it step by step. We hope that in a few months we will have completely refactored it. And then we're actually going to start removing components. What you will have left with Nuku server is a multi-site application platform that allows you to create any application. Will there be anything in it? No besides user management, component management, installer, and plugin management, all the rest will be gone. And then I look at, where are the show guys? Well, there they are. I look at Oleg, who did a great presentation about how they use Nuku Framework to build a completely separate web application, and that's going to be very interesting for him because then I, he can simply install the components that he needs. Then again, you need to give us a little bit of time to get there before you make assumptions about what we're doing. Finally, we're doing Nuku Desktop. This is the part I'm most excited about. It's using Titanium, and the guys from Titanium gave a great presentation in the first day. What we're doing is we're taking Nuku and Nuku solutions out of the browser and onto the client using Titanium technology. Why are we doing that? Because we believe that to build a web operating system, you don't want to be in the browser anymore. And this is not we that's saying that. This is what Apple is doing. This is what Chrome OS is doing. This is what Google is doing. This is where the web, I think, is going. I'm not sure yet, but five to 10 years, most of the internet traffic is not going to go through web browsers anymore. Already 30% is pure data traffic. Uh, we're slowly moving away from using web browsers into using take our clients that are specifically built for a purpose like our application for JM Beyond to register and to create our schedule. There's a very good example of that. So those are the three parts. Three parts to the architecture, three parts to the platform itself. Um, we think we fairly can call this a platform. It's a little bit more than a framework. Right? It has the framework part, it has the application layer part to create something that actually can be executed and then on top of that you have the desktop part that allows you to bring it to the client. And then, are we ready for that? I think we are. We have this saying in Nuku. We have that since the first day. Stick to the code. It, it comes from this pirate movie right, called Pirates of the Caribbean. There's actually a book about pirates and how pirates are influencing the economy and that, that pirates are actually in a way that we as geeks are in a way pirates. You need to read the book. I'll, I don't have the title here, but I'll post it on, on Twitter. Um, stick to the code for us simply means we like to work with people. We don't like to talk too much. We like to work with code and we'll let the code do the talking, so that's what I'm going to do today. I'm going to show you code. If you cannot see it in the back, please come a little bit closer because it might be a little bit small. I'm going to try to zoom in and out so that you can follow step by step. Uh, this is always the fun part because these parts go wrong and they will, they will definitely go wrong. Uh, I have equipment. Okay. I think I need to keep it very close. So, what I'm going to show you, we built last night at that, oops, at 2 a.m. in the morning. It has a few issues, but uh, okay. Last year, when we did our workshop at JM Beyond, we created a component called Comtada. We actually showed you how to go from a Joomla component with a lot of code to a component with almost no code. We showed you how to go from to do to tada. I'm not going to do the same thing. Well, it was to demonstrate the magic for the people that remember. I'm not going to do the same thing. I'm just going to build upon that tada component and show you a lot more. So what we're going to do is, well, first of all, we need to build a simple component 
uh, and we need to start with the basics. So maybe I need to, well, I'll zoom in step by step. Step one, I already did that. Um, we need to add, and then, you see that? So we need to add a database schema. There's a lot of stuff in here. Don't look too much at everything. We have a task ID. Our the doc component is going to manage tasks. We have a task ID, a title and a description. Enabled and access and ordering, those are less important. But title and description, more, most important. This is what we're going to fill in in our form. Now, we have the database. When you create a component, you create a folder in your components, in your components folder. It's going to be a backend component. Step one, well, let's just do this step by step and see what we get. Error component not found, of course, because there's nothing there yet. How do we make sure that our component gets found? Ladies and gentlemen, oh dear developers. And then you all shout, you put an entry file in it, exactly. So we put an entry file in it, and our entry file, I'll remove anything that we don't need. It's going to look something like this. I'll make it bigger. Whoops, eee, like that. This is the factory in action. This is the service architecture. Okay, factory get admin com to dot dispatcher. We're going to get a dispatcher for this component. And then we're going to dispatch that dispatcher. That's all that we're gonna do. It's one line of code. We see what we get. We get this. We get new and delete and we get redirected to a view called Tadas. That's because when you don't have anything, then automatically he goes to the Tadas view, which is resource oriented because he, he's not gonna allow you to use uh, come tada without a view. Otherwise you don't have a resource. So we're there, but we're not showing anything yet. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to add a task manually And there's already one in there. Um, let's delete that. Okay. So I'll add a task manually. Yeah, it's not going to learn that. Go. So field one for char. No, 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 no. I'm going to be wrong. I never do that. Ah, there it is. Thank you. One, well, probably five because the title. Task. Task. Enable this one. What you also see is that um, the fields are already pre-filled with default information. This is part of the database schema. It's important uh, that you set correct defaults. So we're going to leave all that slug. It's going to be task. And we're going to go. Okay, then we have something like this. Okay. Now. We won't have anything here yet because we, won't ha we don't have a view to actually show this information. He's going to, view, to go to view tadas, but we don't have that view. Our table is called tasks, so we need a specific view for this table. What will we do? We will add. Same thing as in Joomla, a views folder, and in that views folder, and I'm going to copy paste a little bit stuff here. We will add a tasks view for our list of tasks, and in there we will place an HTML file to be able to render HTML. I'll leave that documented out for the moment and then basically I don't have anything yet besides this. Now if I go here I should be able to go to view as tasks and then 
Oh yeah, true. I need a default view, a default HTML because we override some stuff there. I'll add that in there. What? Now I'm gonna try to get resources first. Haven't done that, but then again, stuff goes wrong, so let's try it. Um, so what we're doing here to show you that, this is your view clause, and this clause is called Comtada View Tasks HTML. It's the tasks HTML view of Comtada. It extends from Comtada View HTML, and that one is found here. The whole the way classes are named is hierarchical. They follow the folder structure. Because you're in Comtada here, this is Comtada views task HTML. If you look at this uh, name of this, uh, of this class, then you see Comtada view tasks HTML. This is how the autoloader knows where to find stuff. Okay. So now, this error should be gone, and then He's telling me that he cannot find the template because we haven't created a template yet. But if a resource-oriented architecture works, then he should actually be able to get me that task already. Let's try that. So the first thing is I'm going to do this and this. OK, this is um, another little toy. It's an HTTP client. Uh, what it does is it allows you to play browser. So I'll play browser. We will do the same URL, comtada view as tasks, and we will send, and then see what he does. And then fingers crossed. Hmm, that's not good. Maybe I need to try another one. He should get me. Then save. I'll try another one. I should get a, an error that I'm not authenticated. Okay, so let's try that once more, and otherwise, stuff is not working. Task. There we go. So he says zero length response return from server. Basically, uh, it kind of means that I cannot get anything because I'm not authenticated. So we need to authenticate first, and we're going to do that with an authorization header. If you don't know anything about what I'm doing here, that's not a problem, but then you need to buy a good book about how the web works. Um, what we're doing here is we're telling, we're going to send authorization data, it's called, it's basic out, basic authorization. Uh, and this little thing here is actually the same as admin, semicolon admin with a base64 encoding. That's how basic out works, okay? So we're gonna do get on the tasks, and there we go. And then uh, we get the same error that we got before because we're trying to get HTML back. Now, if I tell this to get JSON, then there we go. Right? How much lines of code did I write? None. JSON. No. Yes. Yeah, sorry. Uh, you were a little bit, you were a little bit too expensive. And by the way, I wanted to go to the Bahamas, so <laughs> I'll just charge the client the same and then go to the Bahamas. Um, so this is cool, right? Now, resource-oriented architecture level two means we can also change that thing. Let's try that. Post. Okay. And then we need a little bit more fluff. We actually need to tell our server which content type we are sending, and in this case, we're simply gonna send form encoded information. We have a title, and the title is task, so let's change the title to J and beyond. Right? Now, fingers crossed. <laughs> and then he created a new one. That's not good. Um, Ah, I know what I did wrong. No problem. I did a post request on the view as tasks, so he created a new one because I didn't do it on the actual item itself. So if I now go my, to my database, and this is actually fun, it's a good example. Uh, if I go to my database, there's another one added. You see, JMBeyond has been added. 
because I did a post on the on the collection, which is adding one. Now I'll I'll, I'll edit. Actually, I'll delete that one. Um, so I need to get ID is six. That means if I do task and ID is six and format is JSON, then we will get and we need a get request and we need to delete that. There we are. This is that item, right? I'm not sure if you're seeing it, but if you don't believe me, there it is. The red is a little bit hard to read. Sorry about that. Um, now, let's delete it. So we do delete. And then we do send. And then we do we get a no content back, which basically means I cannot give you anything back because it exist, doesn't exist anymore. And now, fingers crossed. There we go. It's gone. That's resource-oriented architecture in action. How many lines of code did I write? I still didn't write li any lines of code. So the last thing, I wanted to change that. So this is number five. So let's first get number five. Get five. Get it. Send it. This is five. Now we're going to change the title of five, and we're going to post to that. So let's change the title to J and beyond. And we send. And then it's going to say, if you see it, maybe not clearly, there it is. Reset content. He has reset the content. He has changed it. So we go here to our database. And the title has been changed to JM Beyond. I can assure you there are no midgets or dwarfs or any elves with magical powers in my laptop. <laughs> they were simply too expensive to hire. We tried, though, but they were too expensive. Um, so this is resource-oriented architecture level two in action. right? You build any component with no lines of code, with just a table, and you get this. Does it solve all problems? No, but it solves quite a few. OK, we'll go, go one step further. We're going to give ourselves a little user interface, because we want to give this to a user. And that user interface means our tasks need templates. Let's add a template. The template is need that. And I need this. And I'll show you the code in a moment. So for our tasks, I'll remove that here. Don't need that. This is your typical form with a table, with a header, and the fields, right? That's what we see here. And this is your, the rendering of your item. What you see here is that there's a lot of HTML in here. If I make it a little bit bigger, there's a lot of HTML in here and not so much PHP code. And you also see that we have adapted ourselves a little templating engine layer that does a lot of stuff already for you. For example, this here means load helper. And this is the identifier of the helper. It's grid sort. And it's going to actually look in your component if you have a grid sort helper. If he cannot find it, he's going to go to the default component and look there if he can find it. And if it's not there, he will go to the framework and ask the framework if it has a sort helper. Which means that in any place in that layer, you can start specializing. And it just filters down. It cascades down until it finds something. If it cannot find anything, then it will tell you, I'm sorry, fault, error. This is service-oriented architecture in action, right? This actually goes through KFactory and then it's going to get that object and then going to create that, that sort filter. Same thing here. Um, this is specifically for helpers. We do that everywhere. So if we're lucky, and I still know how everything works, we will need to get a user interface. There we go, right? Very typical user interface. Now, if we click that, we want to edit the item. We get another error. There is no form that we can use to edit. So we create a form. We do the same trick. We add a new view. In this, this case, we need to ask the task view because this is specifically one task that we're dealing with. The information for this view is specifically one task. Uh, let's see if I added an HTML. I need to copy that too. Then we're going to add another folder and we're gonna move that in here and I'll also copy this 
There we go. So the form here does nothing more than rendering. Well, actually, I'm going to get some stuff out. No, I'll leave it in. It's not taggable anyway. Um, so this is the form. It has an, an, an title input field. It has a description input field. And it loads an editor with some settings here. Again, you see K factory in action here. Get me the editor object. Render that. And then here below, this is for later, we're going to add tagging and revision support to this component. Uh, the code is already in. Uh, this is actually checks if the task is taggable. This is our uh, event driven architecture in action. It's not taggable, so it won't show anything. That's for later. So now we have a form, which means that if I go back and I go here, then we get this. All right, form. Um, let's change the task. And save it. And there you go. All right? How much code did I write? Zero, zip, nothing. I just got, got, got a designer to write me some user interface. And it still works. Um, other cool stuff that this does is, for example, I'll change it again. Um, yeah, I need to add the behaviors true. Um, so, we have that. Now, this is your basic CCK, right? Uh, define a table, define a form for an item, and define a list to show those items. Uh, True, I can also go to here. Now, I want, I, I kind of do new and I can do delete, so I'll add one. This is new task and new task. And then we save that, then we get a new task. Okay, now, in Joomla, you have Created on information, modified on information, and you have uh, locking, which is what is it called again in Joomla? I remember. Uh, checked out, right? So that the table keeps information about the state of that specific object. When was it created? When was it last modified? And is it locked, yes or no? Um, if you develop that in Joomla, you always need to redevelop it and you need to inherit from the J table clause and you need to add your own logic to it. Um, in our case, this is done through behaviors. To do that, we are going to create a specific row for this task. So we're going to do folder databases. And then new table. This is the same thing that you would do in Joomla inheriting from JTable. The only thing that we do here because all that stuff already happens in the background. The only thing that we do here, and I'm going to take some fluff out that is going to overcomplicate it. These two go, and these two go. Well, that can go. So, we'll zoom in a little bit. Come to that database table tasks, which is our object for tasks table inherits from k table table abstract the name